Uh, the last group thought my presentation was shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and do better. <laughs> um, I'm John Stokes, partner of Real Ventures. It's an early stage venture capital fund based in Montreal. I recognize a few faces from yesterday. Um, uh, Real Ventures is a, a uh, so about $100 million that we're investing in primarily Canadian web and mobile startups. Um, I obviously therefore see a hell of a lot of pitches, um, but normally those pitches are related to raising venture capital. Um, the, the, the talk that I'm going to do today is a little bit more, I'm trying to make it a little bit more generic because most of you aren't going to be out there raising venture capital, but I do think some of the skill sets that, that I help to teach entrepreneurs about how to pitch for money are somewhat applicable to, to what you, you might be pitching for when in, in your life, whether it's pitching yourself or whether it's pitching ideas that you have. I'll say, please feel free to interrupt, uh, ask questions as we go through. A lot of the stuff I say, because it's a more generic type of um, pitch training or, or, or is, is somewhat a little bit difficult to, maybe a bit difficult to apply to your specific circumstances. So if you have some of your own circumstances, feel free to, to jump in and, and ask um, questions about what I'm saying. So, a couple of things before we get started. Whenever you are telling, whenever you're pitching, have in the back of your mind, every word costs a thousand dollars. Therefore, every word you use, it costs you more to pitch. Reason being, words are very, very powerful things, and you want them to have the impact they should have. And the more words you put around the impactful words, the less those impactful words stand out. And I can't stress it enough, do not use too many words. As I'm saying that, it's really hard I'm trying to use less words. And as I go through, if anyone thinks I'm starting to use too many words, hand up, too many words, John. And if anyone says anything when we have the audience interaction, just think about trying to not use too many words. Some people felt dismally in the previous one. Um, secondly, um, <coughs> pitching is rarely a rarely a do it once, win or lose. Pitching is an iterative process. It's I get to the next stage, I get to the next stage, I get to the next stage. Whenever you're pitching, you should be thinking not can I win, but have I increased my chances of winning? Can I get to the next level? What that means is, you don't need to tell everyone everything. You just need to tell them enough and no more to get you to the next level, whatever that level might be in your particular scenario. Does that make sense? That was actually a test one. I don't believe that at all. No. <laughs> right. Um, Real Ventures also runs an accelerator program. I'll ask the same question I asked yesterday. Hands up, who knows what an accelerator program is? Okay, please find out what an accelerator program is. It is something which uh, is changing the way in which innovation happens, and it's something which everyone needs to understand about how impactful these types of things could be. Real Ventures uh, runs a, a three-month accelerator program in which we take in up to 10 companies, give them $50,000 and three months of intense mentoring to see how fast they can accelerate their business over that three month period. Um, two cohorts ago, Sam from the Transit app did a pitch. Um, the, 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 uh, the accelerator program culminates with a demo day and normally in front of eight or nine hundred people. So Sam was pitching in front of eight or nine hundred people. And I wanted to show you something. It is about raising money. It's about uh, four and a half, five minutes long. But it, we will use it and try and think through it. See anything which strikes you as <coughs> you read through it, note it down because 
There will be some questions about it, and there will be some questions. There's also some important things that relate to the rest of the presentation where I'll draw out ideas. So here's Sam the Transit app. Good evening.
and launch on new platforms starting next week with the largest mobile market on the planet, Android. And we also want to have GeoFence notifications, bike sharing, mobile ticketing, all to improve the commuter's experience, but more importantly, collect more data to have an even deeper understanding of how millions commute every day. Our team is ready to take on that challenge. We're designers, developers, mobile passionates, but mostly believers that the developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich have public transportation. My name is Sam from Transit App. If you want to help architect the cities of the future, come talk to us. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm uh, pleased to say Sam did raise $800,000 as a result of the three months of that pitch. Um, and business is going from strength to strength. So <clears throat> we will going to refer back to that uh, slide as we go through. Um, and uh, and uh, as, as we go through. So try and recall and remember as much of it as possible. Um, so first thing is whenever you're pitching to someone, Understand that everyone, and it was obvious when they come into the room, everyone's minds are elsewhere, everyone's doing something else. What you want to do is quickly and simply get everyone in the audience to understand what it is that you want to talk about, but also understand that they may not be ready to hear you or hear the crunch of the apple. Um, they, they may not be ready to hear it, so give them a chance to acclimatize. Here's Sam's chance to acclimatize was... Um, Hi, I'm Sam from Transit App, and we're building, we're going to power uh, public transit for the planet. It was simple, it didn't make the audience feel stupid, you didn't have to be technically capable, you didn't have to know what they wanted to do, it's powering public transit for the planet. It's very simple, so whatever it is, try and start with something simple, something that doesn't make the people that you're talking to ever have a chance of feeling like an idiot because they didn't understand what you say. It's really just a chance of acclimatization. Once the audience acclimatized, then you can narrow the focus. Um, you see the apple? Can you just hold the apple up? High above your head. <laughs> can everyone see the apple? Yes, everyone can see the apple? Yeah. Okay. Right, everyone is now focused on the apple. I know that everyone's on the apple. Everyone is wondering why we're talking about the apple. If I now want to start a story that's going to lead you on the path, I know that story is going to start with an apple. You all know it's going to start with an apple. When I talk about, I'm not going to start a story about an apple. When you start talking about narrowing the focus, it's finding something by which you can narrow the focus because you are going to tell a story. And it's almost like a magician. You know, a magician will come and suddenly something will appear. It's actually, I don't know if you know this, not magic. It's actually an illusion, and that illusion is created because the magician has got you to focus somewhere, and because you're focused somewhere in your mindset, he can do whatever he likes because he knows he has control of your focus. That is what you need to do when you're presenting. Take control of someone's focus. Some are better than others, some are easier than others. Anyone have a sense of what Sam tried to do in terms of, bear in mind he's pitching to investors, what did Sam try to do as far as capturing or, or, or narrowing the focus? What was, what was the thing he used? So like at the beginning, he put up a lot of um, just like figures. You know, big numbers. Big numbers. So. Yeah, exactly, 100%. Big numbers. As investors, we love big numbers. And if you listen to what he said, the way he drilled it out, 40 million daily commutes in Tokyo. 120 million daily commutes. He's not, the other words are all the same. So again, going back to the every word, thousand word thing, those words did not um, create any confusion or lead away from the words that he was trying to do, the powerful big numbers. He's got big numbers, Chip. Those are big numbers, I'm, I'm ready to focus. That's, that's very, very important. Try and find some way that you can focus. 
it's not about your business, or it doesn't have to, it shouldn't necessarily appear to be about your business, or necessarily about what you want to talk to them about. I talked about an apple. You know, everyone's wondering why the hell they talk about an apple. I guess I could have found a way to lead from apple into focus. Well, I guess I probably did, in a way. But it's about finding some way to narrow people's focus so that they are ready to go on a story. It's not about trying to tell them about your product, your service, the thing you're trying to sell. It's just trying to capture their mind. So it's much more important that it's interesting to the people you're talking to, intriguing to the people you're talking to, or intriguing to everyone. That's what narrowing the focus is about, not about you and what you're about to pitch. Once that focus is narrowed, then you can start to talk about a little bit about what it is that you want to talk about, and understand that you're going to tell it as a story. You, have, you really are Hollywood scriptwriters here. You're telling it as a story, and so once you've captured that focus, you're then going to go on and you're going to talk about an opportunity. Now, I hear pitches all the time, and they always sort of oft, they often say stuff like, "I want to fix something because it's broken," uh, and they talk about problems, problems, problems. Um, hands up here, who actually has any problem at all? What, who here has at least one? problem, big or small, in their life. Right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Right, everyone look to your left, unless you're at the very end and you can look to the right. Okay, now, so the person, the people with their hands up have a, have a problem, big or small. The person you're looking at, do you actually give a shit about their problem? <laughs> Not really. No one really cares about your problems. And in fact, you know, that person is always telling you about their problems. It's like, oh my god. I don't want to hear about your problems. It's negativity. When every, even if you're trying to fix a problem and the person knows they've got a problem, don't look upon it as a problem. Look upon it as an opportunity. An opportunity. And normally when I look at problems, and I'll try this, I tried the other class, and the other, no one had a problem. Does anyone have a problem, I mean a, a real problem, that they're trying to fix? <coughs> a problem that, try, that you're trying to fix, or, or a solution that you're trying to, to put out there that will fix a problem. Um, okay. We got an event in two weeks. Uh, bought the room was booked for it. The person tried to book the room didn't book it. So it's already been booked. We have to book a new venue now. Okay. So um, whilst so that's a pro that's that's your problem. It's not a problem you're trying to fix. So let me give you another. I mean, let me give. And in other words, you're pitching to fix someone else's problem as opposed to your problem. Uh, I'm an investor, and I plugged it yesterday, and I'll plug it again today, in a company called Ulala. Ulala is a mobile app for students and student unions and student organizations in order to help uh, improve campus life. And the problem that they're trying to fix is as student-run organizations, trying to get your message into students that just care about occasionally studying beer, wine, and other things, how do you get your message across to people? It's a real problem trying to communicate with students and get information and messages out. But students' unions throw a hell of a lot of money at trying to communicate to students. Even though it's really, really hard, and really, really difficult, and it doesn't work that well, they still throw massive amounts of money at it. So whilst, yes, I could come in and say, ooh la la is trying to fix that problem, actually that's not what we say. What we say is, it's really important that information gets to students. In fact, students' unions think it's so important that information gets to students, they will do whatever they can to get it into them. The desire and need of students' unions to deliver stuff into people's hands is so powerful they will use a whole bunch of different efforts and walk, go through walls in order to deliver it. That is a massive opportunity for someone that has a solution 
that can deliver it. But you don't come in and talk about problems. Uh, sorry. Uh, you come in and talk about it as an opportunity that, that as a business owner, the opportunities, and this is when, when Ula La is pitching me, the opportunity is to be able to deliver something which means they won't have to walk through walls. I'm very, suddenly I'm excited, I'm like, so you're telling me students' unions are walking through walls to do this because it's so important to them, but now you're going to do something which allows them to not walk through walls? Suddenly that's very exciting to me, and it's positioned as an opportunity. I don't need to know about the problem, I just need to know that people are willing to do anything to achieve their end goal. So that feels much, much more powerful. So wherever possible, try and not position it as problems, try and not be negative. No one really cares about problems. People care about opportunities, and it's much more motivational and much more inspirational. Um, this bit is the, the toughest bit to understand. Uh, it's called Highlight the Insight. And the insight is a concept which is the thing that differentiates your view of the world from everyone else's view of the world. And because it differentiates your view of the world, it differentiates, uh, it causes your actions to be different, it causes your approach to be different, it causes pretty much everything to be different. So whilst you might look like just another student sitting next to another student, the insight that you have about where you want to achieve, where you want to go, is very, very different from elsewhere, from others. It is a very hard concept to grasp. Sam has, has, uh, um, has got an insight that drives his business, and it, did, it is supposed to come through quite clearly. Can anyone have a guess about what was the insight that drove Sam's business? Um, given that his, the objective, as you said, is to capture massive amounts of data to improve public transit for the planet. That's what the, that's what the opportunity is, but that's not the only people that have seen the opportunity. Everyone sees the opportunity. But what's the insight, the thing that, is, that really makes his business different from everyone else's? No idea about, okay, a couple will start here. It's a of data and how other people, but other than users, can use it to make So, about collecting data and using it better, I think that's absolutely the opportunity. Okay. But any other company that's built a mobile app yes, will do the same. Um, he focused on the daily commuter rather than focusing on a wide range. Did you listen? Were you listening to the previous one? That's exact, no, 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 the previous lesson, because that's exactly the right answer. It's too easy. Well, actually, maybe it wasn't too easy. Maybe he did a good job. That's exactly it. It's, he, he, everyone recognizes the real value, the real opportunity, is in collecting data. The more data you can collect, the more powerful the offering you can get, and the more opportunity you have to influence and change public transport. That's, you know, anyone could come in and tell you that. In fact, hundreds have. And you saw in the pitch, he, saw, he showed like a lineup of six different apps, some built by public transit authorities, some built by other individuals, all which saw exactly the same thing. The insightful thing that he had was that it's about the daily commuter. Everything has to be about the daily commuter. That was the insight that drove his business. Which means when you go to transit app and you press the button, as he said, all that pops up is something which is 100% focused on the daily commuter. It assumes you know where the bus stop is. It assumes you know what route you want to take. It just tells you very simply and quickly when the next bus is. Because that's really all I want to know as a daily commuter. So if I've designed an app for a daily commuter, it means I'm more likely to open it more. It means I'm more likely to use it more, which means I'm more likely to capture more data. Their whole business is driven about building an app just for the daily commuter. Yeah. And again, you may not remember what he actually says at the end. And if you want to plan a trip, press the button. But it's like almost like a throwaway statement. Because his insight is if you focus on the daily commuter, everything you do is about the daily commuter, you'll win. So 
wherever it is that you're presenting and pitching an idea, try and find the thing. It's not about the opportunity. Everyone sees the opportunity. And it's normally not about the solution. Everyone knows it's the mobile phone. It's about the insight that is, differentiates your approach and your idea from everyone else. And in his case, it's the daily commuter. And everyone really needs to, you really need to try and find what am I saying that would not be repeated by the other person sitting next to me or the other company competing. I have to be saying something different than what they would be saying. And it has to be truly insightful. It is a hard concept to grasp. And as we go through, if anyone has things that they want to ask about their particular situations, about insights, we can, we can talk about them. <coughs> if um, when it comes to when it comes to pitching anything, I, I sort of hated this yesterday. It's not about you. It can never be about you. It has to be about them. It's very hard to not think about you. I do it all the time. It's really, really hard. But it's important that whenever you're pitching something, you need to think about them. And by thinking about them, I mean really think about them. And that's why you need to, to sort of be able to paint what success would look like for them. And if you want to paint what, not, 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 not be hung up on what success looks like for you, but paint what does success look like for them. If you go for a job interview, you obviously know what success looks like for you. It means working at that company, having your business card, getting paid. That's what success looks like for you. What does it look like for them? You becoming an employee does not, is not what success looks like for them. That's not success. It's beyond that. It's more than that. And it's the same when it comes to pitching for a business, doing a startup, speaking to an investor. What, as an investor, what I really care about is how successful can your business be for me, not how successful can it be for you. So really going that extra mile and thinking, what does success look like for them? And it's not shallow, it's very, very deep, and you need, requires a lot of thought. Um, this next thing is, is once you've, once you've presented an idea, you've explained the opportunity, and you've really helped them understand what the success would look like for this opportunity. The next thing is, okay, I buy into everything you're saying, but why is it you that is going to make this success for me a reality? And it's the most important thing, and it's about faith. I. You know, I read a CV, what faith can I get out of a CV? I can't get any faith really out of a CV. It ticks a few boxes, but it's about really, how can I convince this person that, that they should have faith in me? And the, the younger you are and the less experience you have, the less people can rely on things you did in the past. Because you didn't do that much in the past. So what really matters is what progress have you made? What progress have you made in terms, of, uh, in terms of achieving something which I would not have expected you to achieve? So when you go in and pitch, you, should, you have to have done more than the person you're pitching to would have expected you to have done. If you've done what they expected you to have done, there's no faith. I have no faith. Yeah, well, you did what I would have expected you to do, so I don't have any more faith in you than I do in anyone else. You have to have always done more. And when I say done more, you need to find a way to convince people of showing how you've done more. And done more is typically presented almost as a, as a video. In other words, it's not a snapshot. Doing more is not another line, I attended this conference in Montreal in 2014. It's, that's a snapshot. It's, why did I attend that conference? It's giving it context, it's giving everything around it, to sort of give a sense that you did things for a particular reason, 
to bring you to the place that you are today. So it's about creating a movie of which I can see that there's a reason why this person is sitting in front of me today asking for this, and they knew that at some point in the future they would be sitting there, and in fact, they have done a whole bunch of different things along the way to position themselves to be in a better position. Life isn't like that, but that's how it has to be painted. I'm not saying that everyone knows what it is that they're going to be doing, but when you do have that opportunity to pitch something, you've got to think through what things have I previously done that are now worth pulling out, wrapping context around, to actually present it as if it was a planned story. That's how you end up giving faith, because it's about progress. Now it's time to change sides of the table. And this is more of a conceptual changing sides of the table. At the start of your pitch, you were talking about, after you've caught their attention, you were talking about the opportunity, uh, you were talking about the insight that makes, makes people think, actually, you know what, they are, t they are approaching this in a very different way. Um, and, and there is something in there. And if they're right, yeah, there could be some success, some value for me. That's pretty interesting. And you know what? I have a bit of faith in these people. Yeah, I have faith. I think they can make it. So once you've gone through that whole thing, you've really done the pitch. You've sold it. People are now sitting there and they're thinking, um, what do we do next? We're on the same side of the table now. And the reason I say change side of the table is because you need to get a little bit out of the pitchy mindset and more into the partnership mindset. So it, it, it is sort of like getting up, walking around the other side of the table, putting your arm over there, and saying, right, now I've painted this vision of where we're going to go. We're going to go there together. Let's, let's look a little bit towards the horizon, and what do we see together? It's a, it's a conceptual mindset, because you are painting a story, you're building a story, that you need to change your mindset when you start going on to the next portion of that. And the next portion of that is related to, to milestones or signposts, indicators. You've talked about something in the future that you expect to deliver. You've talked about success that you expect for, for other people, that you expect them to receive. But as we said at the beginning, it's not about winning today, it's having a chance of winning. So you really do need to find a way to sit with them and say, we're pretty sure we know what we're going to do. But very soon, if we head in this path, we're going to have some milestones or some signposts that will give us a sense that we are heading in the right direction. And there always needs to be context around that. Um, the, with Sam, he had a few milestones that, that, that he was talking about. Do so you all remember what, what some of the milestones <coughs> that Sam was talking about? Mexico City. Mexico City was a proof point, yeah. <coughs> Expanding into like bikes and other forms of transportation. Yep. Do you want like 400,000 users in a year or something like that? Number of users, yep. Yep. Do you want to go from like 100,000 users to 500,000? Yep. So all of these things are milestones. There's a whole bunch of different ones. These are all things which that he won't have won if he hits any of them. But he will be giving it it will be a sense that actually this guy could win or his team could win if he does hit those. So ensuring that, okay, 500,000, are we buying into that? Are we all agreeing together? Yeah, okay, 500,000 is what we're going for in terms of the number of uh, weekly actives. But it's about setting milestones to show to people that there is no guarantees in life, but that if it is likely to succeed, this is what it will look like. And it's really getting buy-in around the table as to what you want to do. And this is something where it's not about you selling. It really is buy-in. It's an agreement with the people who you're pitching that you and they together now buy into a shared vision for how you're going to do and what you're going to achieve together. Um, <coughs> next is... Um, you now that you have a, again, you're sitting on the same, the same side of the table, 
It's really important to, to understand, and it comes back to faith again, give people faith that you're a visionary and not a dreamer. Who, who knows what the, who, has, has, who can make a suggestion as to what the difference might be between a visionary and a dreamer? A dreamer is somebody that uh, can never achieve what he thinks of, and a visionary possibly could achieve whatever he wishes for. Okay. A visionary, I think, has a clear path of how they're going to get where they want to go, as opposed to <coughs> as they have a goal in mind, they have no pathway. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. In a word, execution. Okay. All right. So. I don't disagree with any of the things that anyone said, but um, normally faith, the whole point of faith is you have to do it without knowing about it. So what I'm really talking about in terms of show them you're a visionary and not a dreamer is how can you convince them before you've gone down a path, before you've executed, how do you show people that you're the visionary and not the dreamer? Because if you wait to the very end, it's easy to tell. But when you're pitching, it's at the very beginning. So it's impossible to tell. So you have to find a way of showing people you are a visionary and not a dreamer. Well, out on the assumption, who here would, who here would like to be known as a dreamer rather than a visionary? Who here is a visionary or would like to be known as a visionary? Great, okay. So, how do I tell the difference between a visionary and a dreamer before the path has started? I tell the difference because visionaries actually explain to me some of the challenges that they know they're going to face. It doesn't mean to say that these are all of the challenges they're going to face, but they give me a sense of understanding that success will not come without challenges. So by actually telling me some of the challenges you're going to face, and maybe also giving me a sense of how you might be able to fix them, or how you anticipate you might be able to fix them, suddenly I realize, oh, you know what? This person actually understands that execution on vision is not easy, and that there are challenges. And in fact, they're already sitting there, even before they face challenges, they're anticipating them. And that, once again, really reinstills this sense of faith. I have faith in this person because they understand that it's not going to be easy and they're already planning and starting to think through it. <clears throat> um, whenever you go into a pitch, it's very very important that you assume that you will succeed. On the other hand, I'll say normally you'll fail. So how do you balance the two that you have to assume you'll succeed even though normally you'll fail? What assume you succeed means is that if someone comes in, as an example, pitches me, this is what I want to do. I have on a couple of occasions written them a check, $50,000. I've done it twice. I wrote the check there in the room and gave it to them. I said, here's the $50,000 check. They looked at me like, what? Is that what you wanted? Well, yes. I say, so here's the $50,000 check. You're going to walk out the room with this. What are you going to do with it? And on both occasions, those people have been, um, well, I guess, um, there was no sense that they knew what they were going to do. What I was expecting is, I already have three people that I've spoken to, three devs that are going to come on board. They're just waiting for me to be able to pay them, but they're ready to go, so I'm actually going to go, I've even got the email sitting in my outbox. I'm going to press send to actually tell them they're on, so they're joining me a week on Tuesday. Um, I've got a, an ad campaign that's ready. We've already done the creative. I'm ready to press the button on that. So now that we've got the capital to do it, suddenly, okay, these people assumed that they were going to succeed. That's why they already knew what it was specifically at a detailed level as what they were going to do as soon as they got what it was they were asking for. 
it's really, really important that you assume that the pitch will succeed. Because if you don't assume that the pitch will succeed, and people do give you the opportunity, and you don't know what to do with it, you're going to have burnt that opportunity in the first place. So really do assume that you're going to do it, and really do have a clear idea of what it is that you're going to do specifically as soon as someone says yes. You're really ready for it. And then, <coughs> final point on this, don't make people guess. Tell people what it is that you really want. Uh, finish your presentation strong, with confidence, telling people what you want, um, and don't leave it up to them to try and work out what it is. It's about taking control and, again, leading people down the path that you want to go for them. If they push back and sort of suggest, no, I don't want this, I don't want that, that's fine as well. You can get into discussions, but make sure that you always ask for what it is that you want and allow them to come back with something else rather than waiting for them to tell you what you want. Um, so, timing is all right. Um, I'm going to go on and talk about a couple of other smaller things, um, but in terms of the essence of how I think you should be thinking about pitching, that really covers all of the, the key areas of, of how I think you should be thinking about selling or pitching anything. Does everyone, anyone have any sort of questions or insights or, or thoughts or disagreements with with any of the stuff that's come in? Or has anyone been surprised at anything that's been said? Um, when you were offering those $50,000 checks and the people didn't know what to do with it, did you pull that out? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. I wouldn't have written the $50,000 check if I thought they knew what they were going to do with it. I'd have probably pushed it a bit harder. So when you're doing these interviews, do you build like rapport before the interview? Like, do you go meet for coffee or like, are you talking about do I build rapport or does the person? <coughs> yeah. Do the people pitching the actually take time to build the rapport? Yeah. Some do. I mean. Does it matter? Um. Well, it, it does matter, but but not to a great to, to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, rapport is only about faith. If the rapport builds faith, it's been great. If the rapport doesn't build faith, it's no good. So if you talk about this going for coffee, I mean, first you've got to understand how busy the people are that you're talking to, but if you talk about going for coffee, yeah, sure, grab a coffee. How do you build, but the only reason to go and see them is to build faith. So you go in and you say, look, I just want to have a coffee. This is, this is what I'm planning on doing. Um, wanted to get any quick thoughts you might have, and then perhaps we can meet again in another month from that. The important thing is that that the only reason you're really there is yes to get some feedback from them, but to tell them what you're going to do. And when you see them a month later, the opening line is, I saw you a month ago. What I said I was going to do is this. What you suggested was this. This is actually what's happened. So it's this progress and faith type of thing. That's the sort of rapport that you, that you need to build. Do you have any advice to give on how to pitch something that you're not passionate about? Uh, I don't actually think it's possible. But I think it's possible to be passionate about anything. It really is. Do you have something in mind? Uh, business cases. <laughs> so, <coughs> I think, again, the business case is not, it's not about pitching the business. It's about the case. And it's about, it's about understanding, I would look upon it more as, you don't have to be passionate about the business, but you have to be passionate about your ability to convince someone else about the business. I mean, it's, it's really, it is really about why am I doing it? Because frankly, the people that you're pitching, the people you're pitching on a business case, 
I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure about this, but so I actually never done that sort of stuff. But um, I'm assuming they're not that interested in either. <coughs> True? Okay. I mean, it's, it's people that aren't planning on doing a business pitching to people that aren't really that interested in hearing about the business. Okay. It's just a test. So if, if you think about it as, you know, my job here is to make this a less boring pitch to these people than anything else, maybe it's, maybe it's a value, right? Find the passion. You can find passion in everything and anything. Um, you just need to find the, the, the root. Yes? Yeah, not to like say anything, but if I could just add on that. Um, also, like, I find if you do a business case, the passion you can find is in the solution you gave. Like, your own work that you put in it, right? So, if you're proud of what you put forward as a solution, you don't have to love the company. But you, if you love your solution when you pitch it to them, then they'll love it too. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's, I think that's one passion. In other words, it, it's finding something you can be passionate about. Um, I just think, I guess, and it's a, I sound like a broken record. Does anyone know what a record is? Uh, I sound like a broken record, and that is, you know, always try and make it about the people you're pitching to, as opposed to being uh, not not to not to say it, but not being pleased with what you've done. But my job is to entertain that person who's going to be bored more than anyone else. I'm going to find a way to entertain them, deliver them what they need. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, what's the most common mistake you see in pitches? Most common mistake. Um, I think the most common mistake is is think when, is thinking that it's about the product, thinking it's about the solution. I mean, people are so excited, and this to some actually, fun, funnily enough, it's exactly what you just said. You know, be excited with the solution you found. I have no interest in the solution. I have no interest in how clever you are for having found the solution. I have interest on how capable you are of turning that potential solution into a real business. So don't get so enamored with the, the product or the solution. Understand that the product, the solution, is something which benefits you and your customer. It has to make, you have to make sure that it also benefits the person you're pitching to. If the person you're pitching to is the customer, don't be excited about the idea of the solution. Be excited about how their business or their, their, their problem is going to be overcome. So that's, that's the thing I think that people do the most. And, I mean, I think all of the other things I've talked about, understanding it is faith. I have to have faith in you and I have to believe in, in what you want to do and try to make sure that you can instill that in people. Um, just timing-wise, I just there's a couple of little other things I want to leave people with. Often a pitch, because there could be a whole bunch of different pitches. Often the pitch is about, as I said at the beginning, not about winning, but capturing people's attention. And sometimes, often I think, and I still do this a lot, that's done in hallways. Oh, I see that person. I, I could really use them for something, or I really want to speak to them about something. Um, so what I wanted to just leave people with was a specific couple of comments, although this is actually sort of a broken down version of what I just talked about before, is about the 90 second pitch. So the 90 second pitch, whenever you want to pitch someone really quickly, the first 10 seconds before you go and speak to them, just understand you have one objective, just one. It's two, I guess. Don't bore or scare them. Don't bore or scare people. Scare is too intense. Bore is start talking about your business. Just do not bore or scare them. Say something which doesn't bore them, say something which doesn't scare them. And we talk about leading into a story. Next 20 seconds is be intriguing. Don't talk about your business. Talk about an apple. Why is he talking about an apple? Uh, talk about Barbados. What are you talking about Barbados? You know, do not talk about your product or service. Just be intriguing so that people are thinking, okay, 
this is something worth listening to. And only then do you glide at the end of your intrigue into what it is that you actually want to pitch them about. And understand, this 90 second pitch is not about winning, it's about getting a chance. So do not talk for more than 45 seconds. Do not tell them everything. Just tell them enough so that they might show a little bit of interest. As soon as you see any interest, stop and use 15 seconds max to say, I need your detail, can I have your details and arrange another time? Because 90 seconds, you can't sell anything. You're not going to be that powerful enough that someone's going, oh, you know what? Yes, let's sit and spend hours. You just use that last 15 seconds to get an opportunity to meet them again. I really recommend this for absolutely everything you want to do. Think about it from that point of view. Um, and finally, when you're building a pitch, I thoroughly recommend that you start the pitch. Don't use PowerPoint, don't use Word, use Excel. Don't even use Google Docs. Use Excel. This sort of shows you what I mean. The reason that you're using Excel is because um, you are a script writer. And you cannot actually build a dialogue, a script, a story when you're using PowerPoint. Page to page to page to page, back, back, forward, forward, forward. As a human, you cannot actually build that whole story. What you need to do is you need to use something like Excel and you need to write each line as a new slide. Each line, focus on the words that you're going to say. What are the words that you're going to say? Not necessarily what is it that's on the screen, but what, is the, what are the words you're going to say, and write those words down, and build it like this, so you can read the whole thing very, very easily. And it's only once you've actually, you're comfortable with the whole script, at that point do you build your slides, and you just take the key words that you think, or the key images that you think that are relevant, from here and put it onto another one. I put it onto the actual PowerPoint or the keynote. And it doesn't show it in here, but I'll show you in a second. As you're building the story here, if you have other ideas, oh, you know what, maybe I should be using this, maybe I should be telling that. Um, and you can... You can actually start building another column with a bunch of other ideas. Don't interrupt your flow. If you have a second thought, use the other column and start building a little flow there. And the beauty with Excel, obviously, is you can pull a line out, move stuff down, pull things in, treat it like blocks, so that you actually can build and move around and really help build your story. I thoroughly recommend you use this. And <coughs> when you're preparing it, the other thing you'll see here, there's things like slashes. So, if I look at this script, Hi, I'm Maurizio. I'm the founder of Instagram. We're your college and university fundraising platform. There's a slash here. Parents love their children. Parents want the best for their children. The slash is a pause. The reason the pause is there is to make impact. When you're pitching investors for money, a lot of them are parents. So by putting a slash in the pause, parents, it makes the people in the audience start thinking about parents, start thinking about their children. It is, again, a psychological ploy. So the way in which, when you write your script, A, this helps in terms of building your story, but really thinking about repetition of words, 40, 40 million daily commuters, 120 million daily commuters. It really is an element of psychology when you're trying to deliver that message and deliver what it is you're trying to tell people. So really using that. The other thing when you're delivering uh, stuff like this, understand, really understand, that how you deliver a message, the speed with which you deliver the message, really really has a profound impact on how the message is received.
If you say it slowly, it has more weight. If you say it quick and really pick up the pace, there's a sense, you know what, this could really happen. I'm really excited about this. It is going to happen. In fact, you know what, let's go and do it right now. The way in which you present, the way in which you talk, really does communicate something special. And I can't stress enough that when you're pitching, understand that you're out there, you're telling stories, and you need to be part Hollywood scriptwriter and, and part Hollywood actor in order to really deliver that message powerfully. I might have time for another question or two if anyone has one, otherwise uh, it'll be uh, time to move on to the next session and I'll do this one again. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, you mentioned the Blue Ola app. What other projects are you involved with right now that you're working on? And what's, what's been so far to date from Adam what's your home run? With it? I mean, uh, I haven't been doing it long enough to have real home runs. I mean, there's been a couple where we've sold well. Um, the two companies which, well, uh, the two companies which most, if anyone's heard of our companies, um, one is uh, Frank and Oak. Has anyone heard of Frank and Oak? Yeah. yeah. All the stylish guys, they all know. And I guess, and Beyond the Rack. Has anyone heard of Beyond the Rack? Yeah, so we were the original. So Beyond the Rack, uh, Jonas Stern, who was here yesterday, he pitched me uh, in a coffee shop, him and, and his partner Rob Gold, uh, pitched me in a coffee shop with a PowerPoint presentation. And they've gone on to raise $75, $80 million, or a hundred million dollars. But it started in the coffee shop with a PowerPoint presentation. So pitching can work. Okay? Thank you all very much for your time.